Good morning. Thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, the, this is our inaugural Rise and Shine uh, breakfast uh, speaker series. My name is Ed Downey. I'll be the uh, MC moderator today. I'm an SCE alumni a board member, and I'm also the president of Capital Electric Construction Company. Uh, the, the SCE Alumni Association is excited to be hosting this event series in collaboration with the SCE Student Council and the SCE Alumni and Constituent Relations and Continuing Education Departments. So I want to thank all of them. We couldn't do this without them. So uh, We started this series because we wanted to provide a leading and relevant uh, content that appeals to professionals and students. We also wanted to bring alumni and constituents and students together so that they can network and allow them to learn from each other. For those of you interested, anybody that needs a PDH, there's a table set up over there and, and we can get, uh, get signed up for uh, one PDH credit. Uh, but at that, this time, I want to introduce Elizabeth Wheeler, who's the Director of Philanthropic Giving for the School of Computing and Engineering. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're excited to launch the Rise and Shine speaker series with such an interesting topic, drones. Today you'll get to hear from some of our distinguished faculty and community members working on various research projects that utilize drones. So speaking of drones, two weeks ago we held a virtual groundbreaking for our new uh, research and education center, the Robert W. Plaster Free Enterprise and Research Center. What made that event a virtual groundbreaking was not only the fact that we held the event actually downstairs in the theater, and we showed a, a video of some 3D renderings of what the building will look like. Um, it was a virtual groundbreaking also because we showed a video that had been filmed by Professor Fields and his, research, or his grad assistant, Sean, using drones. So that drone film footage gave our guests a really unique flyover view of the new building, which will be located outside of Flarsheim Hall. And we all got to sit comfortably in our seats as we watched with a bird's eye view uh, as a backhoe broke the ground. So I am going to welcome up our Dean, Kevin Truman, to come up and tell you a little more about the building. Thank you. Well, again, good morning. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I have Elizabeth's speech here in front of me because I wasn't supposed to be here today. Um, I was supposed to be in India. Got to the ticket counter on Saturday and looked down and my visa, it's a uh, day, month, year, and not month, day, year, <laughs> and it had expired. So uh, I'm, I'm here and, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the new building. It's been a great um, couple years as we've traveled a path of talking to many of you and some of you and some of your companies about this uh, Robert W. Plaster Free Enterprise and Research Center. Um, it's going to be a 57 to 58,000 square foot facility. Um, I always laugh. People always ask, where's the dean suite? There isn't one. There's one office in the entire complex, and that's for someone to manage the laboratories. And so it truly is a research center, education center, uh, that is uh, geared towards the faculty. But it's the interesting piece as I go into this is that it, it's also about community. Uh, there is an innovation makerspace kind of concept inside one of the floors of this building, and I'll show that to you here in just a second. And that's open to the public. It will be open to the public to come in, play with that equipment. You can even get access to some of the research equipment if, uh, if you talk to the right people, right? So as I go through this, I want you to think about each of the different spaces, and, and is that something I might be interested in seeing or interested in, in participating in, in something in those, those spaces? So look at the plan is to open this on the fall of 2020. Uh, it's a high-tech research and learning space for the campus and the Kansas City at large. Um, it's, it will be a new entrepreneurial makerspace with industry-grade equipment available for anyone to use and a much broader audience than just our UMKC family. So I have to unfortunately turn around and see what the slides look like. This is essentially what it's going to look like. There are actually two components and you'll see that on the floor plan in a minute. On the far right-hand side you can see that extension is the Structural Engineering Laboratory and that's because in Kansas City we have a large number of civil engineers and structural engineers and we don't have a facility like that now. So it's a high bay. Um, strong floor facility. And then on the left, it houses most of the other research uh, and student-centered components. So, so if we take a look at the first floor, right? So the first floor, when you look at this, has essentially a clean room on the far right-hand side. Uh, that space uh, really lets us 
and enhance our collaboration typically with the health science partners. Most people don't understand, but about 30% of our research at the School of Computing Engineering is either with pharmacy, dentistry, nursing, or, or medicine. And so there is no clean room facility on this campus. Most of the time we have to go to, to Omaha or we have to go to Mizzou or somewhere else and rent space when we need clean space. So that's on the far right hand side. The student team is really important to the School of Computing and Engineering. And if you go downstairs on the second floor, you'll see um, the Baja buggy is sitting underneath the stairway. So that will house Baja buggy, it will house the uh, robotics teams, it will house a uh, human powered vehicle if we decide to do a concrete canoe or a formula racer, it will be all of those things. And the collaborative project space is a student design space uh, to do uh, essentially industry projects. Next, we'll go to the next slide. So on this floor is essentially the Free Enterprise Center. What was going to be a standalone facility originally on the front of the campus and we now have integrated it in, into this facility. And there's some really great components. So the virtual reality and augmented reality showroom on the right hand side you see there will have all the different types of modalities for 3D um, technology. So it'll have a holopodium, it'll have an interactive mirror, it'll have a concave uh, screen much like you would see it in IMAX. It will have essentially a cave uh, capability. Anyone that wants to come and play with that equipment can do that because in addition to that, we'll have a training facility both for students and, in, and community to come in and learn how to, to essentially program in 3D or use 3D, right? In addition to that, we have the maker space there, which is more like an innovation space with uh, what I would call low to medium end equipment for, for people to build prototypes. And then we have the 3D printing room. Now, we will have low-scale 3D printing throughout the facility. In that 3D printing room, though, will be the types of printers like bio-tissues and, and metals, the, the types of, of 3D printers that are probably a quarter to a half million dollars. And you can get access to those if you ask the right people, right? So um, that's kind of a, a high-end virtual prototyping and then a physical prototyping facility for everyone. Next. So this floor, um, what you can see here, um, the main component of this floor is we have a two-story motion capture lab. And why is that important? Because we actually like to capture the motion of these drones, and right now we fly them in the atrium of our facility. Uh, we have to screen it in with, with netting and make sure that no one gets hurt. So now we'll have a two-story motion capture lab. But to give you an idea of our, the current motion capture lab we have um, has about an eight-foot ceiling in it. We actually do use that for the conservatory for dancers, for conductors to try to get the form correct with theirs. You can make movies very similar to Pixar. You can look at uh, biomechanics, biometrics. And so the motion capture lab is going to be surrounded by, first of all, the unmanned systems lab, which would be the drones um, and other f vehicles, the bioimaging and biosignal uh, operation. We do have one classroom there that we're still trying to decide what we're going to do with that. On the other end, we have high performance computing for cybersecurity, data analytics, um, uh, software engineering, and of course, that will be part of what powers all the other pieces inside this facility from a computing standpoint. <coughs> Next. And on the fourth floor, it will be a power electronics, electromagnetics, and renewable energy lab. Um, what you don't see there, well, I guess it is there, that little white box will most likely be an anechoic chamber for any of you that know what that is. That's essentially a, an isolated space where you can isolate transmissions, nothing in and out. Um, and on the roof, there will be one more. Yeah, on the roof, there's the renewable energy deck. We hope to expand that a little bit, but it'll have solar panels and turbines and all the kinds of things that we do. Inside that renewable energy lab will also probably have a smart grid technology which will link down to the high performance computing. So you can see the, the facility is really geared towards research and active learning for our students. And um, so it's, it was a little odd to go out and tell people there's no offices, no, nothing here. It's all about collaborative research. Unlike the old days in, when researchers would come to a university, they would be given a lab and they would have that space and they thought it was their space and they owned it. These are all interdisciplinary. They're all collaborative. They'll have multiple names, multiple research teams working in those, those facilities. So it's a whole new way of thinking inside the School of Computing and Engineering. Uh, and, and we hope that this will then also bring other components from the campus, as I mentioned, the health sciences in particular. Um, but we also want community. 
So if you see components in here where you think it makes a difference for you, by all means. Um, I have to go to a different commitment, but Elizabeth will be around and, and would be happy to talk to you more about this facility. Um, and and we, I will tell you, these are the supporters, many of the supporters, uh, about 20 different companies or individuals uh, help support this uh, facility. And, you know, if there's anything that, that rings true to you that you think might be important, definitely talk to Elizabeth. So these community connections are really vital to the success of the school, and we want to make sure that uh, you as alumni, community members, want to come in and partner or work with SCE. You can find all kinds of ways to partner through scholarships, through um, financial support of facilities like this or researchers or research projects, serve on advisory boards. You can come and speak if, to different classes, uh, student groups, give internship opportunities to our students. Um, and definitely hire our students after graduation. Now, the one trick about that is we have about a 92% placement rate, and most of that is from internships, people flipping right into those positions. So if you want one of our good students, you should probably intern them, you know, so that you get that opportunity, right? So if you want to learn, learn any more about this, you can talk to Elizabeth, you can talk to Katie. Uh, I might be around a little bit later, we'll see. But I'll tell you what, this is the future for the School of Computing Engineering. Um, the new chancellor wants us to grow significantly. This will help us do that. We've been short on research lab space for quite some time, and this is now going to take us to the next level, if you want to call that, right? So thank you all for coming today and attending. Um, I hope to connect with any of you that want to at any given point in time. All you have to do is, is place a call. Thanks. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you, Dean Truman. Appreciate that. It's a, it's a great thing that we're we're a part of, and we're we're growing the the SCE. It's awesome. I I love being a part of this as part of the Alumni Association Board. So, thank you very much for that. Uh, right now, I want to introduce our first presenter, Anthony Caruso. So, Anthony Caruso is a distinguished professor of physics and astronomy, a professor of electrical and electrical engineering, and associate vice chancellor for research at UMKC. He has been awarded over $37 million in funding, published over 85 peer-reviewed articles, holds eight patents, and, is, and has supervised uh, over 50 undergraduate and graduate students. Anthony has been honored by Int the Intel Corporation, the Office of Naval Research, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and the indus and, uh, industry peers, the R&D 100 Award, for technology processes developed while at UMKC. Most recently, Anthony is overseeing a counter drone program that he'll speak about today. So, quadcopters, fixed wing aircraft, other drones present a, a real threat in terms of just being a kinetic threat alone. So, kinetic threat in this case means that they are transferring their kinetic energy to an aircraft or to some other medium. And there are now documented places last fall where there was a there was a quadcopter that was uh, in the way of a commercial jet on final. There was a quadcopter that got tangled up with a New York Harbor-based asset from the DOD last fall. The FAA has run a number of simulations trying to understand the threat space for these UAVs being taken into the, the intake of a jet and whether or not that poses a threat as well. You can imagine having a swarm of something like these sitting at the end of runway 35 at Whiteman Air Force Base just being ready to be sucked up into the intake of something like a $1.96 billion asset that would be taking off from that runway. Right? That's pretty cheap to do something like that. There are also uh, <clears throat> improvised explosive device or chemical-based payloads or even electromagnetic payloads that these drones can carry. There are a number of documented places where uh, these have been used in theater for dropping small, small grenades. And there are places like uh, like in the Ukraine, where 
they took a thermite grenade and dropped it into an ammunition depot and caused a billion dollars worth of damage in that ammunition depot. This is a rather large uh, system uh, akin to what Travis is going to talk about here in a little bit with, uh, with a number of grenades snapped to it that was home built. So this is a, you know, this is a $800 to $1,000 type system that they put together in the Ukraine. Uh, and then those of you who are aware of what happened just a couple weeks ago with the assassination attempt in Venezuela, uh, it just provides further impetus to how cheap and how easy it is to access these technologies and to apply them. And when you have something that's that cheap and easy that can cause that much damage, it is truly an asymmetric threat. So for the, for the <clears throat> hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars that you can put together a system like this, you can cause 10 or 1,000 times more damage, and that's what makes it asymmetric. So we have, we've talked about a kinetic threat. We've talked about a, a, uh, an improvised explosive device or even a chemical one. So you have spray, spray planes that could also go over the top of the Mizzou game, for example, and release biological agents. You wouldn't even know it. You wouldn't even know it's in the air. As another example. And then the third space that prevents a, that provides a threat is that of the uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance payloads. And this could be just as damaging economically as any of the others are by being able to capture information that you wouldn't want somebody to capture. So this could be for just seeing what you have on a piece of land. And if you're a farmer or if you're Monsanto uh, and you don't want to know what's going on, or you don't want someone else knowing what's going on uh, at a hyperspectral image level, uh, that could be damaging. Maybe you don't want them to hear what's going on. Maybe you want to use one of these drones to jam somebody's communications. So it is extremely cheap now to have something like this, this uh, 12 volt plug-in type GPS jammer to just add to your drone system and have that block the signal communications for an important event that you want to hold. And then there's also lots of other listening devices that you can put onto a system like this. And as these systems become more complicated in their, more complex in their ability to have stealth features and not be heard, uh, it's a lot easier for them to hear electromagnetically as well and you not know that they exist in that space. So we may have something like a, a $2 billion asset sitting you know, 40 miles away from here and have something on the order of $200 to $12,000. And for just another couple thousand dollars, you can add on the full swarm capability for these systems. And this technology now, since I, uh, since I pulled this, this figure, is becoming dated. I mean, you've seen some of the uh, some of the threats that were posed from the Olympics, for example, in being able to take a thousand drones and create these beautiful images. Well, that's that's pretty easy compared to what they would do here. So, how do you attack a uh, how do you attack a drone if if it's presenting a threat? And you could use kinetic-based weapons something like a phalanx-based system. You could use something like eagles or nets. And you could also use a non-kinetic solution. The kinetic solutions are no longer something that we're OK with using. If you're out at Whiteman Air Force Base, you're not going to rain down a bunch of 50 millimeter rounds all over Knob Noster. And the alternative soft kill is not something that is 100% sure, and so these these non-kinetic based solutions are are becoming more and more prevalent in the in the research and development aspect. <coughs> so, a examples of a non-kinetic weapon would be directed energy weapons, and directed energy weapons sort of fall into three classes. One is the high power microwave. In which
which you are putting tens of kilowatts per meter squared onto, onto a target. This, this uh, image here represents a, um, a system that was developed by the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Division in which they have 95 gigahertz waves coming out that actually boil the outer layer of your skin. So these were used as a crowd control based asset uh, called the active denial system. You can also apply this to, to, uh, to drones at lower frequencies and get the same type of effect. The high energy laser literally puts a hole into the side of something by ablating or burning that material out. So you still end up with a hole in something at the end of the day, but it's a directed hole and as long as you know where the beam stop is, you can use something like this. With the high power microwave, you have plausible deniability. So you don't have a hole left behind. All you have is possibly an upset that happened in your electronics, or you have a transistor that gets burned out. And nobody's going to go back and try to cross-section that transistor and look at it through a transmission electron microscope to figure out whether it was burned out. So that ability to have plausible deniability and say that you really didn't try to take out something is a nice part about high power microwaves. And then there are these other categories in which you can have something like a laser dazzler is considered a directed energy weapon. You can ionize the air and send a lot of current down. So that would be something like creating an artificial lightning bolt. Or you could have an acoustic hailer as an example of something that can damage through, through pressure waves. So in our, in our research program here at UMKC, we are developing the algorithms necessary and the infrastructure necessary to identify this, this threat space. So we want to be able to see from 40 kilometers away that you have these drones that are incident. You have some sort of object in the sky. And then as they get a little bit closer, and you are in the, say, 15 to 25 kilometer range, now you want to be able to differentiate whether it's a bird or a UAV. There are lots of programs right now that are developing drones that look like birds so that you could pass through uh, as a Trojan horse. From there, you want to be able to classify whether that drone is actually just an Amazon drone returning from dropping off a package or whether it's carrying some sort of payload that you're concerned about. Is it just carrying a camera and it wants to go collect ISR information? Or does it have a couple jugs of unknown liquid on there that could be used for, for some nefarious purpose? And then to use another algorithm set to decide how do we want to take out this asset? So if you're on a military base or you cross the military airspace, the the rules are different. So the rules of engagement there allow for you to take down this drone. But before you get into that military airspace, what are the rules? The rules are those of the of the standard US government for civilians. And right now, we cannot take out a drone in that space. You cannot just go and apply a weapon to take out somebody's UAV. So you can sit there and you can hover outside of Whiteman Air Force Base below 1,200 feet, and nobody can do anything about it. So. That's, that's what the identify part is. And then the generate and couple part is actually applying these high power microwaves in a way that you're using the, the least power density to enable whatever effect you want on this, on this drone. So power density means, uh, power density or electric field value is the, uh, is the, is the energy that is used to cause these things to either flip over or to burn them out completely. And so how can we adjust the waveform of that high power microwave to make it so that you need just the minimal amount to cause whatever that effect is that you want? You can either just cause these things to bobble, you can cause them to return to home, or you can completely hard kill and take them out of the sky. And we have to have rules and decision sets that are backed by our policymakers that allow us to decide how we want to take those out. And that's part of the development process for generating these high power microwaves. 
And then in the end, we want to be able to do some sort of battle damage assessment to know whether or not we actually <coughs> did what the job was for that, for that specific mission. And that means going out and doing additional measurements and, and having the software to, to back that up. So to do this, we have a, uh, a monster team from across the nation composed of Department of Defense Laboratories, Department of Energy Laboratories. We have one large defense contractor. We have uh, a bunch of small businesses. Some of those are service-disabled veteran small businesses. And then at least three participating universities. So there are lots of students that are coming out of this. There are uh, there is a there is a significant demand right now for every student that we graduate from this program to go into a warfare laboratory or to a small business who has more funding than they know what to do with right now for this counter drone space and for developing other high power microwave technologies to go and do electronic attack against some of our adversaries. So that's all I have. Uh, be happy to answer questions during the panel session. All right. Thank you, Dr. Caruso. Appreciate that. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but when I'm watching some of this stuff, I see, I see the information there, and you see half of it in television programs and things like that, just little bits and pieces all the way through there. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to, uh, to introduce uh, our next presenter. Travis Fields is an assistant professor in, in the Department of Civil and Mechanical Engineering at, at uh, UMKC. Travis is the director of Drone Research and Teaching, Drone Research and Teaching Laboratory. <laughs> Sorry, Travis. And is leading the uh, charge for Roo Fly, so a new flight to service and training program for unmanned aircraft to be used at the university and eventually throughout the community. His expertise in aerial delivery systems and unmanned aircraft theory and application includes trajectory generation, control system design, unique aircraft construction, and flight testing. He will be speaking about uh, drone regulations today. So, Travis? Thank you. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so, FAA regulation is not the most uh, exciting of topics, I think. Um, I'll do my, my best. I'm not, we're not going to go into like the deep uh, part of the regulations, maybe high level, and then um, that will lead us towards the panel where maybe we can have uh, particular questions, and I'll have my plug at the end. Um, so some of this comes up as the, the regulations came out, what was it? It was just over two years ago, I think, that you could now legally perform commercial drone operations without going through these kind of very tedious processes of getting certificate of authorizations through the FAA. So now they have these generic rules, just like to uh, flying a normal airplane, um, that really enable a lot of different applications of research as well as um, kind of commercial uh, enterprise. So the first thing is, of course, well, why do we need these regulations? And you might have seen, well, maybe the top video, the other one's a little bit, took a little bit of digging on YouTube to find. Um, so the first one is just going to show you really why we have to worry about uh, drones. I mean, they're fantastic tools, uh, but if you're not careful, um, they can really cause some scary situations to occur, like that right there. So that drone is, is roughly this size, but actually fully loaded. So this one's not carrying, it doesn't even have a battery, set of batteries in it. Um, so you have something that's 40 pounds just skyrocketing out of the sky. That's pretty scary, and that I mean that skier finished didn't even notice that it hit right behind him. Um, that to me is terrifying. We've actually, I'll admit it, we've crashed our handful of drones, and it's really scary to watch these things crash. And I've been the pilot many times. Uh, we don't really need the audio, but we'll I'll have to listen to this. Just another example. This is uh, these people actually look like they know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, with this particular drone, they're taking it up and flying it around, and it's got a big camera package on the bottom, and everything looks great. But, as you'll see in just a second, it's not. And this is where you don't know. It just happens all of a sudden. It's flying fine. Looks great, and then all of a sudden, it's not. Bleep. So this one actually smashed into the car, and it, this video cuts out, I think. But there's, I mean, there's actually damage to the car from this thing smashing into it. Um, and if you've ever 
looked at the batteries. These things are uh, run on. They're lithium batteries. They are scary. If you want to go on a YouTube tangent, type in lithium battery fires on YouTube. And you can see six 10-foot flames coming out of some of these batteries by just whacking them with a hammer, which is why we can't put them in our check bags on airplanes, and you can't have huge ones. Um, so just having one crash, we've had batteries swell. We haven't had one puncture yet, but it could happen. And you can now create a wildfire. You could burn a house down because you can't put them out. At least most people don't have the fire extinguishers necessary to put them out. So they're pretty expensive. So leading into now, all right, why we have to have these regulations? what the regulations are. Well, they're split into two categories from the big picture. The first there on the left, if you're a hobbyist, basically think about it as if you're doing it for fun. If you're paid in any capacity during research, um, R&D, anything like that, you do not qualify as a hobbyist, which is strange because I can take this drone and fly it here, and that would be considered for, uh, I'm doing it for compensation because I'm paid as an employee of the university, but if I take my suit off and take it home and fly it on the weekend, it's totally okay because I'm flying for fun. Exact same system, same person, different application. And different rules sort of apply. Uh, so then on the right you have your commercial or research uh, rules. That's where you're falling under what's called Part 107 through the FAA. That is the, the part of the rules that drone uh, rules fall under. So there's Part 61 for pilots of real planes and then you have 107. Seven for drones, just an example. And just to kind of look at these a little bit deeper, so for the hobbyist, basically you have a couple things you have to do first. You have to register your drone. Actually, you register yourself as a hobbyist. Five bucks for three years. Uh, this has been challenged many times in court where it's they've won, they've lost, they've won, they've lost, and I think the current one, the FAA, has won, so they are forcing you to pay this five dollars. One thing that's interesting, you have to fly within visual line of sight which means you have to be able to see it. So these drones are pretty small. So if it's a mile away and you can see a tiny little dot, that doesn't quite qualify. But also, if you're wearing FPV goggles, that is not line of sight. You Actually, it's even worse. Just wearing those means you are not allowed to fly because you can't see the aircraft. You're seeing from the aircraft. Unless you have, there's some really fancy ones that have like see-through glass in them so you can actually look out in the sky. But if you really follow the regulations directly, just doing FPV flying like the little drone racer guys are doing, that would not be allowed under the FAA's current rules. At least as far as I can interpret them and as well as uh, several attorneys um, interpret them. And then they also stipulate you need to follow community guidelines, mainly because you might be at RC parks where they have rules on payload capacity, flying characteristics, whatever it might be. On the flip side, for the commercials, you basically have the same kind of rules. Five bucks, but it's for every aircraft. So if you want to have 100 drones, you have to pay five bucks for each one for every three years. So we have quite a few, so we've got to pay that bill. You need to obtain your remote pilot certificate. I'll show you some examples of what that might uh, um, be made up of. Your aircraft has to be less than 55 pounds. This drone, fully loaded with a full payload, is right around that. It's about 50 pounds, give or take. So this gives you just an idea of about the biggest thing you can fly in normal FAA airspace. We have a bigger one, but we have to take that to a restricted airspace that's actually made for drones um, that the government controls to be able to operate it. Same thing, you have to fly beyond or in uh, visual line of sight, below 400 feet, less than 100 miles an hour. So you can't make a missile. And you can't fly over people. And you fly within Class G airspace, which I'll show you in just a second, but it's most places around as long as you're not near airports. There should be really on every one of those an asterisk though. If you really want to, you could fly over people, you could fly in a different airspace, you could fly over 400 feet, but you have to get a waiver from the FAA. And it takes three months to try to get it. And I, I've tried twice, been denied twice, I haven't put tons of effort into it, but they don't give you any reason necessarily on why you get denied. They just say, here's your thing, you failed to meet safety requirements, you're denied. Even if like, you submit a 50-page document, that's all they'll tell you. So you have no idea why you didn't make it in the first place, and you have to do it again. So it's just a kind of a frustrating process. But know that there are ways to get around this. People fly at night. You just have to carry strobes and show mitigation on how you can be safe about it. OK, so for the airspace, just a really quick. Uh, basically, the Class G is this green stuff down here. <coughs> It's most places where there's not an airport where there's some other controlled airspace and then higher altitudes. But you're not allowed to fly in the higher altitudes anyway. So it doesn't really make a difference. 
with the small caveat that the 400 feet altitude requirement is also, you need to be within 400 feet, or cannot be within, I think about the way it's phrased here. You can go higher than 400 feet if you're within 500 feet of a structure. So Kansas City has some really tall radio towers that are 2,000 feet or 1,000 feet high. You can actually fly all the way up those and fly around them and do your inspections if that's what you're into, um, as long as you're not potentially busting airspace. So that's where it gets kind of complicated. Okay, so some of those are just kind of showing you the high level, really what it is you have to do to get that certificate is you have to take this exam. Um, those of you especially that are still students, you see this and say, all right, 60 multiple choice, 70%. Ah, you can almost guess that probably. But some of these things, and actually a lot of these are pretty intuitive, like um, are you being macho or not by flying even though you don't have full battery and it's cold outside and you're tired or you drank last night? It's like these are obvious answers. You know what you're not supposed to do. But up here you can see the regulations, that's just memorization, but you have things like aviation weather, airspace, airport operations. Those are not necessarily intuitive. And so that's where it comes in handy to either go online and, and do a training program, oh, well, I guess I'll show it in a second, or through our program as well. Uh, I just picked a couple of random uh, example problems that can potentially be on the exam just to give you kind of a flavor. Looking at FAA sectionals or airspace sectionals is kind of it takes a little while to get used to looking at them, but once you understand, there are actually a lot of questions on the test that are, that are underneath this category, but they're actually pretty straightforward once you see what you're looking for. But just gives you a quick kind of sense of what you need to, what you need to know. Uh, but as I mentioned, you can either go to an online, like even YouTube has people that have done these review programs. We also, if I jump to the bottom here, we have a training program. Um, right now, the plan is to offer it the week of January 14th. We did it last year around the same time. It's focused on industrial applications, so like people that might be wanting to do inspections, surveying, things like that, mainly because we know those people have to be extra safe. If you're flying for a real estate company, flying a little DJI drone over a house, it's not that big of a deal if you crash. But if you crash something like this, carrying a $20,000 camera, and that company has insurance through that, you're now gonna create a huge storm of problems for that company. So you cannot crash if it's, if it's your day-to-day -day job. Um, right now, the, the cost will probably be about $600 a person. It's in the entire week. Typically, it was Monday to Friday last year. We may do Monday to Thursday. It's really nice in January because it's ridiculously cold outside. So it gives you some indication of what it's really like if you had to go out and do an inspection and you have to do it in any weather conditions. What are the things you need to think about? We had iPads that froze and turned off in the middle of flights because it's so, so cold they won't turn on. Batteries that won't let you take off, they say battery's too cold, can't take off. Uh, you see some interesting problems. The reason why we do this class is because to pass this kind of an exam, you could almost guess it. It's, it is possible, it's a 70%. You can probably get a third of them by just looking at the answer and using your brain. It's the other two thirds, you guess four, get one fourth right, you're pretty close. But that now means you can do commercial drone operations. You could go fly for a company, you can go fly for real estate, for insurance, whatever it might be, without ever having touched one of these drones. That to me is scary. It's basically like getting your learner's permit and then saying now you can go do commercial operations. It doesn't make sense. And it's because how does the FAA enforce it to force some sort of training program? It's just they had to make rules quickly, and even then it took a really long time. To do a training program on top of that would be very challenging. So what we try to do is we have this class that's a week that gives you half the time is covering the theory. It's not the most riveting, but we go through and we do a lot of practice hands-on, looking at sectionals, finding answers to questions. And then the other half of the week is flying real drones. We have people that have never touched one before. You come in, it's nice because you can break our equipment instead of your own. We start with really cheap ones and work our way up to expensive ones. And then we put you into really bad situations to see what kind of decision you're gonna make. So we might take you in the parking garage and I'll tell you I want an inspection of this pier that's in there and tell you to go fly it. And I'll tell you, you're not close enough, I need to see better. You're not close enough, I need to see better. Until somebody in the class will crash. They will keep going and actually crash the thing into the wall because I said I wanted it closer. That's a real scenario. We've been in that kind of scenario doing inspections um, out on a bridge where they, the inspector wants a better view. It's up to the pilot to make that decision that, no, I can't get closer because it's not safe. I want to put you into that and see what you do so that you kind of get an idea of what it's like. 
So that's really the focus of the class is on that flying aspect. So that if you have no experience, hopefully you come away with an understanding of your capabilities for whatever application you want to do. I think, I have to ask, yeah, that, that's all I have. I think then it's the panel time, right? Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Fields. Uh, really excited to be moderating the panel today. We have some really great panelists here, and with us, Dr. Caruso and Dr. Fields, who you've heard from uh, previously. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Scott Jackman, Dr. John Kevern, and Suman Sarapali. Uh, I'd like to give uh, Scott and Dr. Kevern and Suman a few minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself, since you didn't. So, uh, Suman, you want to start with you? Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, you grab the Hi, uh, my name is Suman Saripali, and uh, uh, I'm the Vice President of uh, CalScot Engineering. We are an early stage uh, aero and defense R&D firm uh, based in Lawrence. Uh, I've uh, started the business back in uh, 2002. Uh, we were working on drones a little, even a little bit before that. Uh, back in, I think, 1998 was uh, the first proposals I sent out to uh, DARPA. Uh, on uh, drone related stuff. Of course, nobody knew what a drone was. At least, they were called UAVs or you know, RPAs, whatever, but uh, uh, autonomous vehicles was uh, kind of what my specialization's been uh, for the last couple of decades. Uh, it's expanded a little bit uh, from just autonomous vehicles to uh, what I would call autonomous computing, so a little bit of AI related stuff. Uh, autonomous devices, so it'll be uh, like IoT uh, type stuff. So all these are things that we've touched on about five to ten years before you started seeing them in the newspapers. And uh, that's kind of what our company specializes in. Uh, very early stage, five years out, ten years out uh, type technologies. And uh, we've seen, of course, the, uh, the drone um, domain uh, uh, go for uh, largely being affected by uh, you know the war effort and also open source efforts uh, over the last couple of decades and uh, we've uh, capitalized on a lot of that I think uh, so we're a small business we're open to working with uh, university professors um, students definitely uh, just listening to new ideas and on any given day um, like what Ed was mentioning the whole multidisciplinary aspect of it is very important to us as we are an early stage company on any given day we'll look at we'll be picking picking up ideas out of engineering definitely but also uh, physics chemistry very early stage stuff uh, not a day goes by you know, where I don't spend a couple of hours looking at what's been happening in the last 24 hours. Uh, and it, nowadays, a lot of biology as well. Uh, so just the inter interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary aspect of the work that we do, I think, is uh, kind of reflected in what is now happening at uh, UMKC as well, and uh, thumbs up to that. I'm glad to be on this panel today and um, take any questions that you guys may have. Hello, my name is Scott Jackman. So I am a, a retired uh, Army officer, uh, 22 years. And during my time in the military, the, to begin with, I was started as a helicopter pilot. From there, you get older, I started employing then satellites and drones. So my 22 years in, uh, most of the time, my broadest discipline was the application of remote sensing tools, whether it be a helicopter, a drone, or a satellite. Retired, what am I going to do? Okay, I'm going to apply those 22 years worth of experience, and how do I do that? Well, whoa, drones are coming on. Excellent. Well, so I've used them for 10 years, but they're becoming more and more a um, a civilian tool. So, excuse me. <clears throat> so, I founded a company called Atlas Team, uh, and we are focused on the employment of the systems that are now becoming more readily available. And the the hardest part for us is is actually it's a decision-making tool and what we do is we employ them and then 
we end up spending half of our time teaching the companies we work with how to drive their decision making process based on information gathered with these drones because a pretty picture is just a pretty picture until you can decide what to do with it or um, a multi-spectral imagery looks like reds, greens, blues, and yellows until you know what red, green, blue, yellow means and then, okay, what do you do because of that? So we've spent most of our time uh, in the la last three years learning the different businesses and how they can use data driven data to drive their decision making process. Um, with that, I'll pass it on. Oh, and thank well, we you for allowing to, me to be so. here too. Uh, I am uh, John Covert. I'm the uh, chair of civil and mechanical engineering, and I'm a civil engineer. And so where sort of where I intersect with uh, drones or UAVs is we had probably five, six years ago, uh, Dr. Fields is doing quite a bit of drone work. And uh, as my statement is, these are completely silly for practical applications because if we say, let's inspect a bridge, uh, if Gary's out inspecting a bridge, that might be one or two days out in the field. And if we thought we're going to use this technology to inspect a bridge, you say, well, 20 to maybe 30 minutes of battery time. We're spending a, a third of that time flying back and forth, changing out batteries. And then we're looking at a thousand bucks a crack for a set of batteries. Now we're looking at like carrying $200,000 worth of batteries and generators and we're wasting all this time and we said it's impractical. What if, uh, what if you could do a high voltage tether so we could just fly this thing all the time? And so we had a little bit of angel funding and we developed a high voltage tether and then we coordinated uh, with Gary back there and we did uh, the first kind of real life pilot inspection for Missouri DOT on, uh, on a bridge. And the best we can tell, it was the first bridge in the United States that was uh, was condemned because of drone drone data. And this was one that, uh, because of where it was at, we couldn't really set up scaffolding. We couldn't get a snooper truck on it. We couldn't, uh, it was out in uh, sort of the middle of the sticks out in Missouri. And so the drone is the, the best technology to get in there. And we got to see some really scary pictures uh, that we could use to, uh, to improve public safety and well-being, and so that's uh, I'm on the you know, the civil engineering side of things. All right, thank you. So uh, we'll start out with some questions, and uh, I'm going to ask a few of them. If you guys have any other questions, you might uh, you might uh, ask Katie. She's got a microphone. We can uh, add to the list, but uh, kind of go through some of these. So uh, first question was, uh, what has been the most <laughs> difficult aspect of drones power supply and improving on it? Um, batteries. I mean, as, as John just mentioned, they fly for 20, 30 minutes. There are some new ones that might do 35 or 40 minutes, but that's just not enough for a lot of applications. If you're flying a multi-rotor, it takes you 10 minutes to get there and 10 to get back. Now you've got 10 minutes at most there with a very small reserve. And um, there's new technology hopefully coming, but that's what we've been hearing for 10 years, and it hasn't come yet. They Marginal improvements, but we need a transformational change. Um, to go to the really big systems now, there are people that are doing trying to do hybrids where you actually carry a gas engine of some kind to produce power, but it's just it's really heavy. So you have to make a huge drone that's now not legal to fly in the United States in order to get that improvement. I don't know if that's enough of an answer. Nope, nope that's that's great. Uh, also wanted to to kind of go into a little bit, kind of bring some of the other panelists in, but uh, on employing individuals, we've got a lot of students in the room here. How do, we, how do we look at and what are you guys looking at for employing students in, uh, and, and getting new employees? Is it, is it from this? Is it from a different field? Is it specifically in, in uh, civil engineering that you're looking for something specifically on bridges and you train them on drones? Or what is, what is your thought process is when you're looking for new employees? I'll answer that or I'll jump in anyway. Uh, one of three here. Um, my biggest uh, thing that I look for is somebody who can solve problems. Uh, and by that I mean, um, if you're going to come to me and say I'm a drone pilot, obviously I'm going to do those things to make sure that you can properly, safely employ your system. And that's kind of like the baseline. But past that, can you solve problems? Because I promise you'll be out there and your system will go down. And I don't need a phone call at 10 o'clock at night saying, hey, my batteries are bad. Well, that's, that's why you are there. You are the expert. Uh, 
figure out how to solve your problem. And I don't mean that being flippant. I mean that's that's the biggest thing is solving problems, problem solving abilities, um, the ability to navigate through the world. Don't get lost when you're going out to find a bridge in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, don't get lost whenever you go find a field that is uh, four fields behind um, the other fields, and you got to find that one. So. Really, it's the, the ability to operate independently, uh, to think independently, uh, to operate within a parameter of, um, here's your, for lack of a better word, a mission, uh, go solve this problem and be able to do it on your own. That's what I'd say for me. And I would say, um, I'd say definitely that. Um, there's a lot of field work involved in this thing, and uh, you better be somebody that can go out there and actually work with your hands, roll your sleeves up, get your hands dirty, uh, there have been cases, uh, I'll give you one quick example. We were out in Finland, yes, uh, Finland, just above the Arctic Circle doing some flights for NASA. And uh, one of our uh, uh, UAVs went down in, a, I think, what was like a fir tree forest or something. It was already getting dark. We looked at each other and said, we have to go get it back. So we start trekking up into these into these hills to get this thing back. That's why, and we stayed up the night repairing it, and we flew it the next morning. So that's pretty much what it takes uh, to do some of these things. But from a perspective of a R and D type firm, you know, we are a little bit selective, and uh, uh, we need people that can do the theoretical stuff, uh, people that can do the practical, hands-on stuff as well. And on the theoretical side, it's not just stuff you learn from your engineering textbooks, right? We are hoping that you have a more of a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, so not just, not just engineering. Do you still remember your physics? Do you still remember your math? Uh, uh, do you have a friend that, uh, that's in biology that can help us with this? That's the sort of thing we're looking for. Uh, inspection. So if we're looking at uh, infrastructure inspection, typically when we go out, the, the civil engineer is probably not the one flying the drone. You're most likely going to be on a team. So you've got a, an operator, which might be what used to be your technician, which used to be a surveyor, is now has an extra credential, who's actually the pilot. And then the, the civil engineer is doing the inspection, is saying, get closer get closer, get closer, <laughs> too close. Uh, and then the other side of that is, I've got some real good video of uh, Dr. Fields swimming in the middle of Missouri. Uh, things you don't think about, the, our bridge the first time out had, uh, uh, there had been a flood and we had a, a tree get trapped on one of the abutments and, uh, and the roots are all sticking up and with a tethered drone, uh, we got the tether caught and uh, it took a nosedive and Dr. Fields went swimming. And, Go pull it back out. So, uh, let's see, say, how many PhDs does it take to go fish a? And then the uh, the technicians up on the ridge said, hey, "Is that big fish still down in that hole?" Excellent. If, if anybody's looking for a drone, there's one in a bog somewhere in Finland. <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> so. Do you think the, the growing capabilities of drones will make use, for, make use for commercial purposes more or less restricted? And, and also, on the military side, too, is that, is that going to cause problems on the, uh, the commercial use for uh, when you're looking at it from, from that perspective, too? Dual use of all assets is something that we are extremely concerned about. So. The, uh, the Internet of Things space and the drone space, I think, is an excellent example of something where there has been lots of sweat equity put in by the community, by all of the interested teenagers who have contributed to making a better autopilot, and all of the makers who have figured out how to 3D print these type of systems. So whether you're 3D printing a plastic gun to take into an airport or you're 3D printing parts for a UAV and they're extremely inexpensive and people are having fun doing this and it's, and it's a hobby, but it can also be used as a weapon, absolutely. Uh, that's the scariest space we can be in are the dual use spaces. Anyone want to follow up? <coughs> 
right. <laughs> um, kind of following up a little bit on that, and we're talking more about commercial, but uh, will licensing, you talked a little bit about it, Travis, but will licensing get more complicated? Uh, will, it, will it become tougher, and, and is there a push to do that? That's a good question. I don't know. It's a good. It, there's a lot of pushback. That's the problem. It's a huge community now, and they already put something out. It took a long time to get to that point. Once you have rules out, it's even worse to try to change them. Right now, they are. There's an impending release of new hobbyist rules because the hobbyist rules are pretty minimal. Fly below 400 feet and make sure you're doing it for fun, and that you're less than the weight limit. Um, but there is a new. Uh, I think I had it up there. I can't remember the part number. They have their own part number now. Those rules are coming out any day and they may dramatically change what you're allowed to do, which will, of course, make a lot of people angry, uh, but I think they are they're working on this dual threat problem. They have to figure, find some way to help control it. I mean, that, that drone right there can carry 20 pounds. It's $5,000, actually it's probably even less now. It might be $4,000. And um, Tony mentioned 3D printing. Uh, the metal on the bottom there, that's the drop mechanism that my students made to drop our parachute system. It's a couple pieces of metal, and then we use a little 3D printer, the heating element in the end of a 3D printer. You stick that in the end, and it just gets really hot and will melt the wire off that you're the string that you used to hold your package on and it comes off. So it's about a $10 solution that can carry 20 pounds. Um, so that's kind of a scary problem, and there is no good answer. I don't know how you would answer that from a regulation perspective. You can say you're not allowed to carry things, but it's so easy to do that all the hobbyists are going to do it. So I, I just don't know what they're going to do. Good question. I think it's something that's being uh, mirrored in just about everything else that's happening in society. Uh, <clears throat> you know, these policies and regulations that have taken 50 years, 60 years, 100 years in some cases to develop, uh, these don't stand up against the speed of innovation that's happening. Right? The, uh, uh, it's just a, a huge paradigm shift, I think, for the FAA. Is anyone from the FAA in the room? But, you know, the, uh, it's a huge paradigm shift for them. Uh, they've been used to dealing with, uh, uh, with certification programs that would take five years, ten years. And the industry was fine with that, right? Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, you're uh, carrying, a, it's an airplane that's carrying hundreds of passengers. Well, that's not the case for some of these things. And uh, the nice thing is, once the rules are out there, let the innovators figure out what the workaround for those rules are. How to operate within those rules, right? But still come up with solutions that become more and more innovative. Like for example, the, uh, uh, now, now the rule is you cannot fly FPV uh, drone racing. You, you, you're not allowed to do that by current rules. Well, the, the rule is 250 grams or higher. So now all the, small, all the drones are getting smaller, the racing drones are getting smaller to 245 grams. And that's, that's beautiful. You know, from a scientist's perspective or from a researcher's perspective, things getting smarter, smaller, faster, more energy dense, those are exactly the sort of things that are needed for the industry anyway. So bring on the rules. We'll, we'll figure out how to innovate around them. Yeah, one of the, um, uh, as he was saying, the FAA was, has been developed to uh, save human lives. I mean, that's, that's really what it was. The, the tort law we have, it's kept aircraft safe. You have no doubts when you go fly an airplane, it will fly. You have no doubts. That's because of the FAA and tort law. But th those things have been developed not under that mentality. So there's, there's, there's a huge uh, friction point between the developers of electronics and IoT stuff and drones and the FAA bureaucrats who are doing what they thought their life mission was to save human lives in aircraft. Uh, so if you look at the Twitter feed on the FAA now though, you'll start to see all the talk now on the Twitter feed is, is about drones or the evolution of these new rules. And the, the Congress just passed like one or two days ago, it's, so it's made it through Congress, the new FAA regulation, which is okay, now they're create rules for flying over people, create rules for flying at night, create rules for flying for beyond the line of sight. So now it's going to take the FAA a couple, three years to figure that part out. So that's, that's our challenge. Um, I mean, I've, I've lost a multinational corporation as a client because we've pushed the limits as far as we could in the U.S. as far as beyond visual line of sight, and we still could not do what they wanted. So they're taking that 
um, requirement and moving it to another country where they can fly in those uh, environments. So, I mean, it, it's real. It happens. It, it challenges us as commercial entities. Kind of, kind of to follow up on that a little bit, but uh, from a hobbyist, from a university perspective, and from a uh, from an individual company, what kind of insurance requirements? You talked about uh, airlines and and you know they're safe. The FAA, you kind of work through. They they have their insurance. We've got so many different things here. What kind of insurance requirements are you guys looking at? Uh, the nice thing is uh, now you can buy commercial insurance for these just like you would for a regular airplane. And uh, uh, on occasions we purchase that insurance and it's uh, readily available now. Uh, that was one of the first questions that we were uh, beginning to look at like 20 years ago when, when this whole thing started was Lloyd's is not going to offer insurance for uh, for a plane that's been built out of, uh, you know, in your workshop, right? Uh, there are no specs. There are no engineering specs on what you what we're doing, uh, and I don't think there ever will be. Um, and I don't think, in some cases, I don't think there even should be, right? Because that uh, that uh, uh, clamps down on on innovation, I think. Uh, but a point will come when things will become uh, standardized. Uh, I think what the important thing to also remember is that you're moving from an aero and defense mentality to a commercial electronics mentality, right? Everything is different about these things, right? The, uh, the, the time it takes to do the development, the time it takes to do the certification, the volumes that are involved, everything is different. It's more of an electronics industry uh, or a domain rather than an aero domain. And you know, insurance uh, uh, is demand and supply. As the number of drones increases, uh, the number of insurers will also increase. And they're already there now, so it's not a problem. So we have uh, basically three types of insurance, and we, as a company, we move through uh, each one of those based on, based on what's going on. So a, a there's hull insurance, uh, which is insures that piece of kit right there for the cost if it were to crash. And we have hull insurance on those airframes that are brand new because those systems are twenty-five to $50,000, depends on the system that's on it. But as he's talking about the rapid evolution, within a year or so, they've depreciated to about half the price. So at that point, then we just, we drop hull insurance on those airframes and don't get it again until new ones. The next thing we have is liability insurance, which is the liability that that drone will crash into that car that you saw the video of. and. And there's that. And then the next set of insurance we have is for the people, the, the people we have working. So I mean, that's um, you know, just um, uh, workers' comp and things like that. So those are the three levels of insurance we have. The, the one thing I want to add is it's kind of interesting because it's a part of this new culture. Um, the insurance that I've seen people use for like small-scale drone operations, it's on your iPhone. It actually brings up Google Maps and knows where you are. You draw the circle on where you want to fly. You say what times you want to fly from, and it gives you a quote for how long the insurance is going to cost for that four hours. So it's like 45 bucks, you're covered, you can go fly, and then you don't have to do it again until the next time you want to fly. It's much nicer than typical car insurance, because if you're just a weekend warrior flying for State Farm trying to make a little extra bucks, uh, that's all you need. You just do it when you need it. And it's for an hour or two, and they charge you based on that. And it's more expensive in the scarier places you fly. It knows. If you're getting close to an airport, it's going to jack the price up on you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so approximately how many, you talked a little bit about building own drones, but how many manufacturers are there in the market today? And, and is there competition? Or, or, is it, or is it coming from the research side more and then the manufacturing? Maybe I'll start and then you guys can chime in. I would say by far the leading manufacturer in the world is DJI right there. I mean, that they make... I don't know, it's got to be 80% of all the drones in the world, if not more. Um, I mean, you, you've seen them everywhere. If you're out somewhere and somebody's flying a drone, I can almost guarantee you it's going to be DJI because they're cheap and they have such a market share, they can lead the innovation. They've kind of become Apple. They're always coming out with the next best thing, uh, which is why they depreciate so much because the next version is going to come out right when you bought this one already that has some other feature that you want. I mean, they do it on purpose and they just bring out incremental improvements. But by, by far, they're huge. I would say DJI is probably uh, uh, the dominant uh, player. 
And I happened to have met these guys. Uh, they're out of Shenzhen. Um, just, the, just the nicest bunch of people that you'll ever meet. Uh, and backed by, they say, about billions of dollars out of Hong Kong, uh, which is why, you know, they've, interestingly, they've taken a product that was an open source product and built a really nice uh, customized solution around it. And they come up with new things every, every couple of weeks, it seems to be. I'd say the uh, DJI we talked about, the next one, SenseFly, is a, it's a Swiss airframe. And the next one would probably be unique as another Chinese frame. Past that, there's hundreds of uh, one-offs or small, I don't want to say, but smaller companies that are building them on demand by design. Um, for a company like us, um, th those smaller companies are challenging because we don't have the maintenance back tail end to go. So we're we're almost forced into um, a SenseFly or a DJI or Unique just because we need the the long-term sustainment of having parts if we need them, or having a known system that it, we, get, we crash one, okay, another one's falling right into it. And the, the pilots have a, a system, they know exactly how it works. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the civil side of it and just some of it, but uh, so what is the biggest <laughs> challenge in, ins in inspecting bridges besides uh, dropping it into the, uh, the river or anything? But uh, what's, the, what's some of the bigger challenges that you have to deal with, whether it's, whether it's line of sight or, or uh, just getting to it what, from your perspective? So if we're doing civil infrastructure and specifically bridges, there is no current regulation that allows drone footage to uh, supplant uh, visual ion inspection. And if we are looking at a bridge inspection, the requirement from the Federal Highway Administration is you must be within three feet. Your eyeball must be within three feet of that bridge. Uh, so that is, we've, we can use that to do, we can use uh, drones to do sort of the global inspection. We still need people to be able to go over, look at it, poke it. Uh, if we've got a crevice that's got bird poop in it and it's corroding, the drone's not gonna be able to stick its finger in there or stick a screwdriver in there and say, that's bad. Other side of it is these drones, if anybody's used, the drones are awesome if I'm out in a big field and I've got good GPS lock and there's nothing to run into. I put that under, under a bridge and I become in a GPS denied environment and we're pretty good this direction, we're not so good, or we're better vertically but we're not so good horizontally and so then if you're you're an average hobbyist in a field, I put you under a bridge, the chance of you running into that bridge goes way up. And then we get sort of weird wind currents around under bridges or next to buildings, so you get a vacuum next to a building. So we say get closer, get closer, sucks you right in. And so that is the, the and we've written uh, some papers where we've looked at how good does your pilot need to be in certain situations? And if you go under a bridge, that pilot has to have three, four, five times the capacity is somebody that's just flying next to it on the outside of the bridge. So it's training and experience. So kind of to follow up with that, do you see a point when the government and regulations will, will allow this, whether it's, whether it's infrared technology, whether it's something else you can put on that drone to, to not be out there and have to poke at the, at the structural integrity of, of the bridge? Well, it'll always be a hybrid. And so you say on, on fairly young bridges that need to be inspected where you have a pretty good reliability, it's, uh, it's not at the end of its life, you can save an absolute pile of money by taking a drone out, do a cursory inspection, and then if there's any problem points, you can send a human out. On the much more deteriorated bridges, you're still always going to have a hands-on. There's We might be adding multispectral or infrared, or we might be adding some moisture thermal cameras, things like that, but it will never bypass that human aspect of it. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, so kind of going back, does, does current research make any assumptions about the capability of drones in the future? Is there anything on, on the drones in the, in the future? What, what's it gonna be, or is it still changing so rapidly that uh, we don't know? <clears throat> so the problems that Professor Kevern just illuminated about not being able to fly in congested or uh, difficult environments 
make the autonomy of these systems something that you really want to push for. So having proximity sensors that you trust, having other sensors that would allow for truly a Star Wars-like drone to go in and to go and poke and prod something and know exactly how far away you are from that thing and take the human out of it completely is where the research is going on the, uh, on the, the high end right now. Uh, I'd say uh, swarming is something coming about uh, rapidly. Um, one person then could control several drones to do a, to do a task. Um, onboard computing uh, is coming on and it's going to be very valuable. So image processing or onboard computing allows a system to go into an environment and then based on what it sees, it makes some calculation predetermined and then takes an action. So in an ag space, it could compute the images on board and then send out a report immediately that what it sees. Um, and as you, as you take that further, you could add sprayers where it could then immediately spray, it could immediately plant a tree. Um, so you could take your mind and take that wherever you want, but onboard computing and AI um, added just swarms. I mean, he, he was talking uh, Star Wars, it's, it's coming. It's, if you ever go to any one of the drone conferences and you've never been there, it's, it's real. The only thing holding us back is the FAA, so it's coming. So there's a, there's a television series called Black Mirror. And one of the, one of the episodes in this, in this Black Mirror series is for uh, bees or wasps that were drone-like that were going out and performing pollination services for, uh, and, and also just had ultra miniature cameras that were on these, uh, on these insects. Uh, DARPA has uh, funded a number of programs in which they've embedded electrodes into moths, into beetles, into other, other insects that they could go and control as a hybrid between man and machine. Uh, so, you know, most of the time we're, we're worried or talking about uh, things of that size, but what happens when you have something that's really small that can still do, still do another job and all of the research components need to go into that. So if you needed a battery system that was going to go on to something the size of a fly or you needed to have a camera system and just figure out how to shrink that down to the size of a fly and incorporate it into something like that uh, and then have you know, thousands and thousands of these things that you could produce for, you know, a penny a piece that could go out and do lots of the jobs that we would need today. And that's where, that's where especially you as students and or alumni who are thinking about getting into businesses like this need to be creative in, in projecting out what are those market needs and where could I have a niche in trying to develop something like this or even think about coming back to school and doing something involved with one of us in this area. I think over here we have mostly focused on flying drones, right? But there are crawling drones, there are uh, swimming drones, there are drones that do multiple things. Uh, there are now drones that you can launch from a submarine that can swim around for a little bit, come to the surface, and 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 uh, and fly away. Um, so there's all sorts. The 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 design space is so huge. It's incredible. That's probably what attracts uh, me as a researcher. Is that literally anything is uh, this thing is only limited by your your imagination. And then the next thing I will predict is that the small satellites are in the same same place where drones were about 10 years ago. Uh, microsats, CubeSats are, uh, that are going to be flying in space are seeing the same sort of miniaturization and uh, open source and uh, uh, cost drop-offs, the same trends that the drone space has seen in the last about 10 years. So uh, I think soon we'll probably see thousands of satellites as well. Uh, and just imagine what that can do for humanity. You mentioned a, you mentioned a couple things there, but uh, 
what what kind of research topics would you like to see incorporated into drones? It, it, it's limitless from what you see, but what specifically, or is there anything that you guys are seeing out there that uh, that would be the next great thing? So, Eddie? I'm gonna chime with what you said, basically. it's. Um, Right now, it's you have to have one operator for one drone, and if you can take away that aspect, you now open up huge possibilities. You can have one person managing an entire fleet, like Amazon. There's no way they're ever going to deliver packages if they require one person for every delivery drone. It's just not going to happen. And how you do that is a challenge. We don't. I mean, people are working on it, but I think that is a specific thrust that needs to be solved. I'd like to hear from the audience a little bit because we're so constrained in our thinking, we're so biased in our thinking. <laughs> what what are the needs that you guys have that I mean just just state problems and we can think about solutions to those problems. Yes, sir. Well uh, just a quick question and, and hearing some of the the problems that drones have or the the limitations with batteries and things, what is the state of the art of Amazon or Pizza Hut or somebody actually creating a commercial business where these drones are flying down the street at 50 feet up and stopping in front of your house and dropping something off. You know, I keep hearing it's coming, it's coming. Is it really? Well, uh, so Boeing, as of this week in Seattle, has hubs around Seattle where you can go to a kiosk. You put whatever you need in there, and you push a button, and it will go up, and it'll fly to another kiosk, and you unlock it with your Amazon key. So that's a, a, that is point to point, point to point, right, right now. But preset point to point. It's preset not going point to, to point. Three twenty three Main Street. Correct, and we've had uh, we are looking at putting a, a center for high density urban agricultural research uh, at one of our locations on Troost. We have uh, Amazon and Whole Foods over here is interested in getting a drone corridor set up to deliver microgreens from that area aut autonomously back to and forth store. to the store. So still point to point. And, and I think um, part of that's because of the regulations. That's what's holding them up. They have been doing tests. I've seen uh, several of the videos and presentations from some of those companies, like Google has one in like New Zealand because they're allowed to there. So they've actually done it, delivered, I think something, um, I think they delivered pizzas for some reason. Um, and there was a demonstration at Virginia Tech where Chipotle partnered with some company and they gave out free burritos via drone to Virginia Tech students. So people are doing it, but it's, right now the FAA is holding up. They don't, how can they get approval to fly beyond line of sight with more than one drone per operator? So it's, until that's solved, that's not probably going to happen yet without some special cases. Are the economics defensible? I mean, Chipotle taking a $3 sandwich to somebody and you're paying somebody, you know, you're paying somebody $9 an hour to fly the drone, your, your drone costs whatever it costs, you gotta buy the batteries. I guess that's all research, right? They, I mean, they it's claim it's cost effective, but I'm skeptical. As well, I don't. I don't know where how they can make that profit. Maybe they're just planning ahead that things are getting cheaper every day, and there's going to be a point where they're going to start making profit. They're taking the Tesla approach, I guess. I if no one else, I'm, I'm, oh. I'm sorry, I'm taking this. But just a second. The um, the economics become a lot more uh, uh, persuasive if you've got higher dollar uh, or or things like, for example, there's a service now in Africa. Uh, where they're delivering uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and blood, uh, so for medical purposes, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, the uh, the army is asking for delivery of of food, uh, so MREs into soldiers' hands out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So there's there's these kinds of applications where it's a it's almost like a no-brainer, or in uh, uh, in places where. Uh, uh, you're living in a uh, on the edge of a mountain, and the next village is another mountain. That's uh, half a half a day drive away, right? But it's only 20 minutes by air. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are some cases where it becomes very. It's literally the only thing that you can do, and money is really not 
that much of a One more question and I'll shut up. And maybe this is for John, but what's the state of the art for civil engineers for surveying accuracy to do a field, to do a plat, to do an ALTA, to do something? How are we there? I, actually, my firm claims uh, that we're going to get into that, and I'm just finding it hard to figure out how we're going to find a section corner in, you know, whatever. All right, so Gary or somebody else can speak up if I am completely wrong and we have made an evolutionary leap, but at this, at this point, all of the civil engineering firms with any surveying capacity as purchasing a drone, is getting drones, is going out there because they don't want to be left behind. We, between regulations and the, the accuracy, besides, I would say, some LIDAR scanning to look at uh, uh, digitizing buildings or looking at uh, construction progress, we're not actually using them for anything other than pictures and observation uh, at this point. So my... You guys doing anything that I don't know about? Yes, we've we've got uh, seven drones uh, that we employ for surveying and video. Uh, basically, it's just like the what was in the past when you flew when they fly a plane over and they do the photogrammetry, and we do the same kind of thing. Only the computers do it for us now instead of having to do the stereoscopes. Uh, but the LIDAR is the thing we need. LIDAR on a drone that can do survey accuracy, we could put that to work with today. And so that was gonna be my question is, do you see that coming soon? That, that is, and so LIDAR on drones is an area, not at UMKC, but at many, many universities. And I would say accuracy that I've seen in the ability at LIDAR on drones, I bet within two years we've got that on, at a useful amount in the survey field. It's just about at the tipping point. Thank you. So I'm gonna just answer something on that real quick. So you as a company, you use your imagination then. You have a design, build, and build phase of your project. Where could you apply drones in the design phase? It's not necessarily the technology, it's, it's how you as a company operate designing stuff. So could you use a drone to more rapidly go out and assess um, a 120 acre lot with trees on it and see where the slopes are. You don't have to be perfectly accurate. You're designing, uh, billing. Could you speed up your billing process so you're getting paid every month on accurate movements instead of every quarter based on estimates? I mean, so it's not necessarily the drone technology that's holding back, honestly. It's the, it's the decision making process in companies. Now, accuracy is absolutely required. No doubt about it, and we need lidar quality to draw drawings. You know, for hospitals, or you know, we've tried to add, add, a, a, you know, a, a tenth layer to a hospital. You got to be perfectly accurate on that. So lidar is absolutely required for that. But there's a myriad of other ways that you can use drones to help out in your in your business. And uh, you know, now thinking out of the box a little bit. When you're designing buildings, can you put things in there that will make it easy for inspection by drones? Is it possible to have a bunch of sensors, uh, so a smart building, if you will, right, that report to a drone that comes by once a week or once a month and just scoops up a bunch of data and sends it you know, back to your design office or your, uh, to whoever needs to, to watch that building? Um, So uh, my question is, is around LIDAR, you kind of beat me to it, but um, is the university doing any testing maybe with smaller LIDAR systems or SLAM algorithms, that kind of stuff, or possible positioning or asset capture or whether it's indoor, outdoor, a combination of things? Um, I know we've used the IoT and the, um, the uh, well, there's all those keywords like blockchain, AI, computer uh, analysis or computer learning. And is that something else the university is also looking at, whether it's maybe it's just asset tracking through photos or photogrammetry um, from the drone, you know? I don't know. That's a good question. So we are, from drones, uh, looking at 
uh, hyperspectral, multispectral imaging, uh, I know that uh, right now, usually the LIDAR, at least at UMKC, the LIDAR is used to uh, corroborate data. I don't know if in computer science or electrical and computer engineering what sort of what their level of LIDAR. We're, there's quite a bit of uh, sensing work going on, but as to specifics, There's a lot of lidars around now. It's uh, microphone. Uh, I don't know if you looked into the. Sorry. Uh, there, there are a lot of lidars now, and that's how that's where the whole multidisciplinary aspect of this becomes important, because the lidars are coming out of the automotive world. They're coming out of autonomous cars. Um, the so the 3D lidars that have been released in the last six months can do a lot of very interesting stuff. Uh, for example, not just uh, uh, telling you where things are, but they'll tell you what speed they're moving, right? Which makes a whole bunch of difference for uh, for designers uh, and planners. Uh, so the couple of companies, I think it's called Blackmore Technologies, another one called Ava. Ava just released something uh, last week, actually. So it's a 3D lidar. Right, and I'm. My interest is around the, the engineering construction space where we can use, I mean, there's there's companies like Redar, Regal that have, you know, some of the most accurate LIDAR systems that you could put on a, on a UAV, but, you know, there's a bunch of variables there when it comes to accuracy, if you're talking survey grade. I mean, when you've got wind speed and, and you know, you've got vibration from the drone, at best, perfect scenario, you might get an inch, inch and a half, best accuracy, and typically you need more than that. Um, but Using those smaller LiDAR systems in an indoor space is really, I think, going to be one of the next big jumps where instead of just using a, you know, a man-made or uh, a GPS, um, in a GPS-less environment, a man-made man operated drone, um, we can incorporate a LiDAR system and actually track where the, where the drone is at using algorithms and LiDAR in combination. We could, I think it's probably the next, the next big step, so. Hey. Uh, I have a couple questions about the autonomous and AI implementation of uh, drones. Are you aware of any projects or research going on with the, you know, implementation of AI in the drone? And if there are any projects or research having what problems they are facing with that? Well, autonomy is uh, probably the the biggest thing that AI is trying to. Uh, well, a lot of the AI implementations are going into autonomy, uh, right? Trying to figure out uh, um, how can the drone best fly or operate in these uh, uh, circumstances, right? Um, so there's a lot of AI that's going into uh, image processing, uh, flight controls. Um, there's, um, it's just, it's just, uh, there is a lot of AI, that's all I can say. It's there. Uh, and it'll just keep growing. Um, there's, again, you know, there's a lot of people that say, you know, I've got AI this, machine learning that. The, what I'm still a little bit, uh, in, in other domains particularly, what we're seeing is, well, where is the intelligence? Right, it's able to do what a human can do, uh, and it's doing it pretty well. But is it doing something that a human is not innately able to do? Right, and that's where things begin to get interesting. But that's another story. And, and I would kind of chime in a little bit. I think uh, AI is such a broad term. It just depends on are you talking about real intelligence or adaptation or learning. Um, so we have a couple of projects we've done or are currently doing that are trying to utilize um, some kind of AI type uh, algorithms. So we're working on autonomous dog fighting right now. So it's kind of working towards the threat. If you can't take out a drone with a microwave because you don't have one handy, could you use another drone to chase it? You don't want a pilot to try to fly because those things move all over the place. And if you're chasing an FPV pilot, it's going to be impossible unless you're really good. But can we make a drone do that? So we're, we're trying to make that work. Uh, we've also done adaptive flight control so that if you have a motor go out, 
can you have the thing learn what's going on in real time so it knows how to make a change? How can I change my control system to now mitigate that problem? Or maybe I try to drop my payload, which we've had happen, and it gets stuck. Now you have a giant pendulum underneath you while you're trying to fly, and that was one of the reasons we've crashed. We had that thing, uh, our, our flight controller started oscillating, payload hit up, or swung up, whacked into one of the motors, ejected the motor off. Flight controller did a 90 degree turn with a drone that's seven feet instead of five feet, um, and started doing 90 degree oscillations down to the ground, smashing the ground, flipped over, and just disintegrated itself. Um, if it had done, had used one of our algorithms, it may have been able to survive because it might have been able to figure out, here's what's wrong, now I need to know what to do with that information. There are, there are people doing it, um, it's just it's, there's, it's everywhere, so all these different applications. I think we have time for about one more question, so. Uh... Um, on identification of a potential foe, I guess you could call it, you called it the Trojan horse at the end of the runway, uh, looking like a bird. Could they, just brainstorming here, all the drones have a, uh, a certain frequency based on the propellers. So could you not use some type of sound sensing device to determine a mile away if something is a drone or a bird, use sound rather than sight or heat? <clears throat> Absolutely, that's, that's a very clever way to do it. So acoustic sensing is one method that's presently used to detect UAV systems. We also look at RF signatures that are coming off of those systems. So if you are receiving or transmitting GPS or you have uh, some sort of remote control that is, that is providing uh, information for controlling that, uh, that system, the, the transmitter that is, that is uh, doing that is also something we can detect. So we're, we're looking at using every, every way that we can to interact with those systems but then the adversaries are also countering those by providing new propeller systems that have less noise and they're masking their RF signature or they're trying to operate autonomously just by GPS alone by only going with a signal upwards and not outwards. So it's a, uh, it's a cat and mouse game uh, that is consistently we make an improvement and then the adversary makes an improvement. And the scariest part of all of this is that it doesn't take much to shield one of these systems to make them make them hardened against the kind of weapons that we're trying to apply against them. That, that is your question? Okay. Excellent. Uh, and Honestly, this is fascinating to me. We don't use it enough in construction, and honestly, I feel like construction, building buildings, we're probably 30 years behind everybody else. We still do a lot of things manually. Trying to get there technology-wise is one of my biggest things at Capital Electric. So um, I want to thank the panelists. You guys did an awesome job. Thank you for your presentations today. Thank you for being here and taking time out of your busy day. But uh, that's uh, one thing that trying to get all of us to learn a little bit more. We appreciate your time and trying to bring uh, SCE and uh, UMKC up to uh, the greatest level we possibly can, so I appreciate that. Um, now, we will be having another one of these Rise and Shines in the spring, so look out for any kind of flyers on that. Uh, we're trying to trying to get it. Uh, if you guys have any, uh, any suggestions, anything like that, please let us know. Please let Katie know. Uh, appreciate all your time, too, being here today. It's uh, one of the good things, so thank you all. Thanks for... Uh, being here and spending time with us.